So Real Life Student Ministries, Movement Young Adults, Full Life, please give him a very, very warm, big welcome to Pastor Simon Davenport. Come on. Woo. Gosh. Wow. Wow. I don't even know what to say. None of it's true except the 300 pounds part. That is very true. Stacy's got me hooked up in there in the gym. Hey, let's pray. God, we love you. God, we're hungry. Father, I thank you for, uh, Lord, the honor that was just showed to me. Father, it means a lot. But God, I pray that, uh, that for the rest of this morning, Lord, we would give you honor. God, I pray that uh, my words wouldn't just be um, just men's wisdom or, or funny stories, but God, that you would speak, Lord, that Holy Spirit, you would do what only you can do and that you would lift up the name of Jesus. Thank you for your presence in worship this morning, God. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I actually don't have much to say today. I, um, I do want to start, though, with just uh, kind of jumping on top of what God, what I feel like God's doing in, um, in Nick's life. Man, as you were worshiping this morning, I just, if, if anyone heard what I was saying up here during that, that interruption, I, I just want you to hear it, man. I just feel like there's such a boldness on your life, and it's here, and it's coming more, and whether it's in film, whether it's in music, whether it's in whatever you're doing, there's just going to be just an ability to break through what people expect, uh, what the status quo is, and it's just going to, it's just going to require bravery, and I just see you stepping out, and just whatever you're doing, and man, God's going to back it up with the, with this, with this spirit, and where people think like, all right, that's just enough, like, we don't need any more of that, I just see you just pushing through, stepping across the line, and God's just going to honor it, man, I'm, I, I love you, man. I'm so happy to be your friend and proud of you. Thanks. And so t- today I've got a, um, I've got a more of a thought that, um, that I really didn't get too much time to, to develop. It, I had this awesome, amazing, well, in my mind, you know, I spent a lot of time on this thing and, uh, and then like last night I just God told me to scrap it. So I've got, it's a, this is more of a, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do tomorrow? And he just told me, Hey, I just want you to preach the gospel. I just want you to preach the gospel, and, uh, and so I got started with something, and uh, I really feel like I've got something uh, to share and something to say. This is, uh, let's go to Mark chapter 5. Uh, this is the, we're kind of tailing it on the, uh, this thought of the power of his presence, something Pastor Nick has been speaking on this last couple of weeks, uh, and this is one of my favorite stories in the New Testament, one of the stories of the life of Jesus. It's, it's uh, from the man at the Gadarene. So this is Mark 5. We might get a couple of scriptures in and we'll kind of paraphrase the rest for time. Um, So let's read it. Mark 5, uh, chapter 1. I'm I'm going to be in the NIV. It says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gadarenes, or Gerasenes, the Gadarenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tomb to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. If you were a product of the 2000s, you would say this guy is off the chain, all right? <laughs> chapter, four, chapter 4 said, For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out, and he would cut himself with stones. The Bible says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him and began to worship. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Um, so in the original language, this word, uh, Gatherings or garrisons, it's, um, if it had a definition, it would be called the reward at the end. And so when I, when I, I, I speak a similar um, message like this when I'm maybe going overseas and doing stuff in Mexico or I'm at a, uh, a public school or something, uh, the place that Jesus went, the garrisons, the gatherings, it's, it's the, the definition of that is the reward at the end. 
So let's give a little context for what's going on. Jesus is right in the, the, the exciting part of his miracle ministry right now in this story. He's healing the sick. He's casting out impure spirits from people. I mean, it is, it's blowing up. And this is a part of his ministry before he's really started really uh, taking off too many religious people. So a lot of people like him right now. So he's a really popular character. No matter where he's going, people are showing up and, and crazy stuff's happening. And I mean, they're, just, they're, they're flocking to wherever he's at. And at this point too, he's... he's, he's found his 12 disciples. He's grabbed his team. And so these guys go from fishermen, they go from pretty much absolute nobodies to hanging out with the most popular man in Israel at the day. So, I mean, they are, they're, a, they're a sensation at this time. And so they're on one side of the, uh, the Sea of Galilee and they're, it's just going down, man. People are getting saved. People are getting healed. It is just, it's powerful. And Jesus is just on the tail end of his, one of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mountain, the Beatitudes, what we really love. And, and so he's, just, he's doing this and he's in the middle of, of this ministry and he's in the middle of just things going really great and awesome. And there's, you know, he's not after the fame, but there's tons of popularity. There's tons of fame. His disciples are, are doing big things with him. And he just stops everything and he says, listen, we need to get in this boat. We need to go on the other side of the sea. He just kind of, he just flips the script. He just stops everything. And so the disciples, um, they're, they're thinking, wow, you know, we're, I, I can only imagine. If I was a disciple at this point and not knowing really the whole picture, we see, G, I mean, Jesus is doing awesome. They're thinking, wow, we're hanging out with the most popular guy in Israel right now. And, and he's, I mean, he's just doing miracles and he's blowing our minds. And, and so if they're going, all right, Jesus says we need to get in this boat and then we have to take this trip. And when we get there, he didn't tell us exactly what we're going to be doing, but we know it's going to be incredible, right? We know it's going to be awesome. You know, they're like, they're like quoting scripture scriptures over themselves like you know god god's going to take us from glory to glory right that hasn't even been written yet but they're still they're still quoting it right he's he's saying they're like man this is exciting we're with the jesus and and who knows what's going to happen so he loads them in the boat uh and and then that's when we hear one of these stories where there's a storm and jesus rebukes the wind and the waves so they're just like you know what it is going down like we don't know where we're headed we don't know what's about to happen but it's going to be incredible right you know, so, so I can just imagine the disciples talking, Peter, James are talking to each other, man, you know, you saw Jesus heal this guy over here. I mean, it, we can't, we can't wait to what, what's going to happen when we get over there. And, um, and so I can just imagine they're, they're in the boat. Jesus just calms the, the waves and, and they're pulling up on, on, on the shores of Gadara, right? They're heading to the Gadarenes, the reward at the end. So they're pulling up and I can imagine, you know, James and John, the guys are looking over the ship. They're like, all right, Where's the crowd, right? Where's the people that's going to be shouting and the balloons and, you know, it's going to be awesome. Like, where, where are they at, you know? And so they're looking and they're like, well, maybe, you know, I can imagine they're pulling up to the shore. Maybe they're over there behind the rocks or maybe they haven't heard that we're coming yet, you know? So they're getting closer and, and they're getting closer and they're thinking, any moment now, this is all going to make sense. And like, the, you know, Jesus' direction to leave this amazing, you know, event over here to go over here, it's going to make sense. And they pull up and, and then they see him right? They see the man. And I just, I can just imagine like James or John looking around and being like, man, is Jesus's GPS like messed up? Like what, like we don't, we see this one guy. Not only do they just see one guy, they see quite a spectacle. The the Bible says that this guy, he was a little different, right? He was butt naked. He was yelling and screaming at the top of his lungs. He had shackles and chains hanging off of him. He had cuts all over his body. They were probably infected. Uh, he lived in a cemetery, right? So, I mean, you can imagine, there's a crew of people, right? It's not just Jesus. I mean, there's a, a, a squad of people loaded up in this boat. And they're, I mean, they're like, you know, God wouldn't waste our time to, to do it. And they, and they roll up on this one guy. And I'm going to call him the man right now. They don't really give him a name. They just call him the man, um, and this guy, if you were, if you were to, to view him through the lens of, you know, of what we can easily kind of get into in the American church, this guy looked like one of those people. Completely unreachable, really completely undesirable. If they came into our church today and sat down on our chair, we would probably have to throw it away. Like, I don't know, I don't even know if we, if we could clean it. You know what I'm saying? And it just, just one of those people completely unreachable, broke every single social norm of what somebody is supposed to look like. I mean, because you're supposed to wear clothes. Not, you're, I mean, you're supposed to wear, you know, we, we kind of wear nice clothes. This guy isn't wearing any clothes up in church. And we know that he was in deep pain. He, I mean, 
Obviously, he was being tormented. There was a spiritual malady going on, but he was in deep pain. And the Bible says that he would, he would cry out. He would scream. He was deeply sorrowful. And he was, and like we mentioned, he wasn't clothed. And, and I just so believe that this is a prophetic image of this generation of teenagers and young adults in America right now. As I was reading this and I was studying about this, um, just in the spirit, I feel like God just gripped my heart and said, hey, this is, you know, you're reading this about one guy, but I felt like the Lord was saying, this is a, this is a generation right now that's in America. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but right now there are more people alive that are under the age of 18 than there's ever been in human history. And that goes for uh, the United States. There's more people that are under the age of 18 and 25 um, that there's ever been alive, ever. I was reading about this and, 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 and praying. God really started just, just burdening my heart that just like this guy looked unreachable, there's a, there's a generation right now in America that are completely done with church. They're completely done. It's been either one or two generations since there was a patriarch or a, a, a strong man or of God in, in many, many houses. And the, the social standards, whether, you know, whether um, they were Christians or whether you know, maybe you guys or your parents were, were strong believers, there was still a moral kind of code, right, that kind of went along with an evangelical slant to how like, we're supposed to live our lives in America. And I think that right now we are so far away from what like maybe my grandparents knew as what is just normal in America. That there's, there's, no, there's no real more context for it, right? Does that make sense? And, and I feel like the church and, 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 and society, because we haven't really been able to reach people with the gospel, we try to throw these chains on people to make them act like us and think like us and make a generation just get it when they've never really experienced the God that, that, that set these, these standards in motion. And I feel like these chains that we've tried to put on, that, that, that I see my friends and I see young people um, weekly, they feel these chains of the way I should be and the way I should act. And, 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 and a lot of teenagers and a lot of people have gone in just complete rebellion. Because they feel the shackles and, and they feel the bondage of this lifestyle that, that people want them to live in. And they've never had an encounter. They've never, they have no context for what that stuff even means or why it's even there. I see a generation that's completely, um, in the church's eyes, unreachable. Because if we're honest, there's a, there's a group of people that we feel kind of comfortable sharing our faith with. They kind of look like us. They're normal. We get it. They, you know, it's kind of a safe way. You know, maybe, you know, they're a Christian. Maybe they just, they're backslidden. You know, we, it's easy to pray for prodigals to come home. But it's really hard to pray for somebody that has absolutely no context at all. And absolutely no desire at all for, to just, you just surrender their life to, to Jesus because maybe they've never even heard about Jesus. There's people, I've got friends that teach in public schools and they have, they have students. They have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and they are 12-year-old students going to middle schools in, in Maury County and in, in, in Williamson County. We think that's crazy, but it's the reality of what's going on in the world out there. And they're naked. And they're exposed, and they're sh there's, there's never been, and there, there's people doing studies right now, scientists and doctors, on the effects of just the, just the intense, just, um, uh, just really explosion of pornography, and, and, and just complete, uh, just throwing away every type of parameter, every type of like mindset that, you know, say my parents or my parents' parents had on sexuality and had on uh, what purity looks like. I mean, completely throwing the floodgates open. I think there's studies that's like 50 to 70 percent of teenagers right now have had uh, encounters with pornography in their life. That's, I mean, to me, that is crazy. To me, that, I mean, that, and, and, and we're seeing it in our society. We're seeing a society that's completely confused about what does it even mean to be a man or what does it mean to be a woman? I mean, I mean, look at the, I mean, if you just look into the media, we're seeing the results of this, but so often we, we're, we, we don't know how to engage culture. We don't know how to do that stuff. And, and so what we do is, is what we 
really know how to do is just grab the shackles out, grab the chains out. And the Bible says that this spirit of rebellion was so strong in this guy. These, this demonic thing that was in him was fighting so hard that all, all they could do was just try to subdue him. In the New King James, the, 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 the language is tame him. Who's ever seen somebody that's just so like a threat to themselves and the people around them that the best that we can do is just try to tame them? Just try to shackle them down and tame them and eventually became such a, uh, such a lost cause they just threw them in the cemetery because you're already dead to us. And I really believe that there's a generation that's just waiting in the cemetery of what the church would call unreachable. That's just one encounter away with the presence of God to changing everything in their life. Changing everything, turning everything around. One encounter, one encounter away. And it, and, and it's just, and it just, it is like, it just, it blows my mind that Jesus called this guy. Jesus called that this interaction with one man, the reward at the end. Like that was the reward at the end. You know, we're going to this place where there's a reward at the end. And I could go in, if you want to study this out and how he, he, he crossed a great divide. He, 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 he traveled over troubled waters that Jesus, he, he made the, he made the, 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 he crossed the great divide from heaven to earth and he came and found us and did for us what we could never ever do for ourselves. But that's a, that's a sermon for another day. But it was his reward. It was what was, it was his vision. It was what he saw was more important than even the big crowd. You know, we know the Bible says that he'll leave the 99 and go and search for the one. And so his disciples are like, you've got to be kidding me. You know what I mean? Because like sometimes we just don't get it, guys. And I, I mean, I'll lump myself right into that. Sometimes we really just don't have eyes to see what God is really wanting to do in our lifetime, what God's really wanting to do in our community and in our state. They're just like, I don't get this, Jesus. Like we were over here and we were rocking it out, man. We, had, we were packing it out and there was all this stuff going on and there was crazy miracles and it was amazing. And you take us all, you load us up on this boat, you almost kill us in the sea and then you're sleeping, that's weird. And then, we're, and then we go over here and there's one guy. Like, what are you doing? And it's not even just one like, holla, like one great out, upstanding citizen and we're gonna get the mayor saved. It's like this guy. You know what I mean? Like, what are you thinking, Jesus. And it is my prayer today that before I get off of this platform, that God would change your plans up, that God would arrest your heart for, whew, for a generation that's living in the tombs and that we would, we would leave the, the things that we think are so important. And so like, you know, this is what success looks like. And this is what success in ministry looks like. And God would just take this holy, he would just mess up the plans just that he would, boom, you guys are getting in the boat with me, you know, and if you're my disciple, you're going to follow me, and we're going to the least of these. We're going to the lost. We're going to the tombs, and that's my prayer, and, and you know, and, and it's not something that you've got to work up. It's, it's something you honestly just surrender to, because when you get close to the heart of Jesus, you start caring about what the heart of Jesus cares about, and it's for people in the tombs. It's for a generation that probably won't ever come into a church if we keep doing it the way that we've always done it. God, mess us up. God, change our plans. God, give us a burden for this generation. God, and, 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 and even if though it feels uncomfortable and we don't know what to do, Lord, I pray that you would give us a burden, God, that you would change our plans, that you would load us up, Lord, and that we would have an obedience to cross over even inconvenience, even things when we leave what we think is success to, to do what you ask us to do, God. Do it in the name of Jesus. And here's where it gets good, all right? So, I love this. All right, so, if you read this carefully, Jesus shows up to the tombs, right? The Bible says the man comes out and is like, oh, hey, there's a guy, a bunch of guys in a boat, right? So, they, so, so, the Bible says that he comes out and he sees Jesus. He sees the disciples. There's this boat there. He's kind of hanging out. And then the Bible says something right on the, 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 the heels of it. He says, when he saw Jesus... He ran over to him, he fell at his feet, and began to worship him. So he's already aware that, that there was people there, but then when he saw Jesus, there was something about him that was different than the other disciples. There was something about Jesus that, that caused him to run 
towards him. And that's where we're going to touch on the power of his presence. What was different about Jesus? What was different about Jesus? Obviously, I'm going I'm I'm to jump ahead. When Jesus rebuked the demons in the man, they recognized that that was, that was Christ. They, 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 they said, what do, you, what do you want to do? You're trying to torture us? You know, what, do you, what do you want to do with, with us? Like Jesus, son of the most high. But in the natural, in this man's flesh, when I read this story, I don't believe that he recognized that Jesus was anything different than the rest of the guys in the boat. You know, when we read through scriptures, we say that Jesus didn't necessarily look like a king. There was nothing like radically different about his appearance or the way he looked or even the way he carried himself. He was a, he was a humble looking person. So, and, and, and we even know that, uh, that John the Baptist, when he was baptizing in the Jordan, he didn't even know who the son of man was going to be. And that was his cousin, right? And, then, and God had to open his eyes and say, wow, Jesus, and he, and he baptized him. So when he saw Jesus, I don't think that it was just like, well, that's Jesus. When we read the scriptures, we kind of think like that because we're just like, well, of course, it's Jesus, you know, I'm going, you know, hurry up, I got to go to work, you know. But, but this guy, when I read this, I think, what differentiated him? What m- made him stand out to Jesus? And I think it was the atmosphere-shifting, changing presence of God that the Son of Man walked in when he was on the earth. The Bible says that when he was baptized in the Jordan, the Spirit of God came on him in the likeness of a dove and remained on him. It remained on him. There was a, there was a touch. There was a, a, there was a manifest uh, presence of God that when he walked into a room, when he walked into a situation, the atmosphere changed. The atmosphere shifted. Very similar to what happened today when we felt you know, the, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the presence of the Lord come into this place, I mean, it, it shifted. Things changed. And up to that point, that was, a very, uh, that was very an unusual occurrence at that time. So I believe that this man had one encounter with the presence of the Lord embodied in Jesus. He had one encounter with Jesus. And that's all it took to change everything he ever thought about God in one second. Everything he ever thought about God in one second. If you notice, Jesus didn't have to prophetically give him the Romans road to how to get saved. Because Romans hadn't been written yet, right? He, but he could have done it because that's Jesus, you know. He didn't have to, to, to talk. He didn't have to condemn him. This guy was probably feeling well enough condemned as it is. He didn't have to talk down to him. He didn't even have to really convince him that he needed help. All he had to do was just show up with the presence of God. The pres- all, all that God really needed was a man to come in contact with the presence of the Lord. And that, that's all it took. That's all it took for something in his mind to shift. Now this word saw, when he says he saw Jesus, the, uh, the, the, the language there, it implies more than just seeing with our eyes. It, 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 it talks more of like beholding or actually like experiencing the, 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 the language there is more of an experiential kind of take it in, like, like, wow, like this is really going down in this moment. So when this guy like beheld, when this guy had an encounter with Jesus, he went running towards him, not walking, not, you know, like, uh, I'll think about it. He went headfirst running towards the Lord. I just wonder how many people are just one encounter away from running just headfirst into the things that God wants for them. How, I mean, and, and, it, and it might be a little easier for me to say because I see this week to week, month to month. And I, and I just, and I just kind of want to share my heart with you guys, but how many people like this man, like this, like the generation that we're talking about right now, are just one encounter away with the presence of God that they would go running straight towards him, straight towards him. I'm going to get ahead of myself, but this, this guy really wasn't even like, like fixed up yet. He was still naked. He was still infected. He was, he was, he, he was still in a cemetery. He was, he still had the shackles. He still had the chains on him. But he went head first, ran at Jesus, and began to worship at his feet. 
And I wonder, like, if this guy could worship Jesus with a legion of demons, like, what's our excuse? I'm not going to go here, but I'm going here. I think sometimes God gets more glory out of people that just really know that they need him more than people that feel justified because they don't need him that week. Or maybe they hadn't sinned bad enough to really have to make a scene in church. But I, I, think, I think that Jesus actually, when we look through scripture and, and there's, there's, there's harlots breaking open, you know, alabaster boxes and there's, there's people that the religious say, if you even knew what kind of woman this was that was touching you, like you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even let this go down. And in those moments, Jesus said, well, it's kind of funny because I'm getting, I'm receiving more honor from her than, than your religious life right now. And, and while I'm stepping on toes, we're about to, we're about to transition. You see, I can preach like this in youth and the kids are like, yeah, all right, man. Like, yeah. Adults are like, whoa, take it easy, bro. <laughs> we love you, Lord. And I'm, I'm me included. How, hypothetically, a bunch of unchurched, don't look right, aren't playing the, don't, don't know Christianese yet, you know, come into church and they just happen to steal our seat on a Sunday morning. Are we just going, are, are we, are, I mean, literally, like, I know that sounds crazy, but like, what if people start kind of coming in here and, and what, what if we're, we're worshiping the Lord? Are we going to be able to receive, to love and to worship right next to somebody that just doesn't have it figured out yet? And they're just still, they're still in all of their kind of mess. Are we going to be able to, 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 to receive them, to love them and keep our eyes on Jesus? Or is that going to offend us to the point that we're just like, well, I mean, church was good, but I just, I couldn't, you know, there's just, I just got too much kind of going on in here. I'm, I'm clashing too hard with people around me to really even focus on, on God. And I'm leaving the service kind of bummed out and, and, you know, and God blessing people's hearts because they, you know, they just, they didn't do me right, you know. When God wants to see people that will absolutely make you cringe in your flesh. Like, have you ever really tried to witness to a transgender person? Like, have you ever really tried to, like, get on the same level as somebody that is on drugs right now? Or, like, is just completely, completely messed up and they're, they're dropping the F-bomb every other word. And they're just, they just do not care at all about, like, your religious persuasion. And yet God called, has called us to love them. Have you ever, have you ever done that? It, it, your flesh hates it. You, you're like, you don't get it, man. Like this is God's house. And, blah, blah, blah. and they're like, what? But I tell you what, it's those people that I found are really just, just one encounter away with the God, not of words, with the God that you don't really have to talk them into it. You're not really like saying, you know, having to give them a, a, a Greek and Hebrew lesson, but they just want to know that that Jesus is real, that Jesus is alive, that he really can help them and he really can turn things around in their life. And they're like, sign me up, sign me up. I don't sleep around anymore, great. Doesn't like that anyway. I'm not allowed to smoke anymore, perfect. It's expensive. You know what I'm saying? I, pro I promise, that's how, that's how people are. But we come around the back way with the shackles. All right, buddy, Jesus loves you, and I'm about to chain you down to this, per this church pew, and you're going to look like me, and you're going to love it. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, you feel a little restricted? Don't worry. That's, that's, that's normal, yeah. That'll go away. You'll, you know, this, this whole feeling of, of claustrophobia in a church pew, like that'll go away after a while and you won't, you won't notice in it anymore. That's like, that's our, that's our answer sometimes to, to the lost. And they see that and they're like, you've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding me. I want something real in my life. I mean, I've, it's, and it, it's, it, it's crazy. And, and I, guys, I know I'm, I'm no Reinhard Bonnke soul winner, but what I've seen is, is, is people that just don't know anything have a lot less like preconceived mo uh, ideas of what Jesus can and can't do. You're like, all right, you're telling me a dude got born through a virgin, 
got killed and then got raised to life? Yeah, he can heal my arthritis. I mean, duh. So you're really telling me that there was like 5,000 men, not including women and children, and he prayed a little like bam prayer and then it multiplied and they picked up extras. They're like, yeah, I believe God can cover my rent this month. You know, like it, it, it's like, it's like we, we, with religion, we make doctrine because we're not seeing the power of God moving around in our lives anymore. So we have to explain why God doesn't do what he says he wants to do. And you pray for somebody to get healed or you pray for breakthrough in their life. We're like, well, brother, I just, I just don't believe that's going to happen. You know, praise God. I just don't pray, praise God. You know, and you're like, oh, it's just crazy. That's crazy. And I just know that this generation is looking for the real thing. And you know what? And it doesn't mean that you've got to be someone you're not. You know what I mean? If you have never sinned in your life and you've just stayed, you've never even left the church. Like you live at the church and, and all you know is church. You don't have to change anything. Just show people that. Just show people Jesus. Just let them encounter the this, the power of His presence. Just let them encounter the person of Jesus. We gotta love people and let God clean them up. <sighs> Help God. So I just, I'm done. Let me get up. Have Matt come back up. And guys, I love the church. I, I ran from, I ran from uh, full-time ministry. I've quit twice. And, and God won't let me get away from it. I got so burnt when I first got into ministry, I didn't want anything to do with it. And I went and I hid in uh, the music industry and did everything I wanted to do. And, and God found me on a, on, on a tour in a, some music venue. And I'm crying my eyes out reading the New Testament. I mean, just... I've not been able to get away from this. And so please don't hear my heart a disdain for the church or a disdain for the body of Christ. I love Jesus and I love what Jesus loves. But I just see that there's such an opportunity in our time to reach the lost, to, to reach a generation of young people that really aren't as lost as we think they are. No one is really like as far from God as we think they are. They might have a really big front on. They might, you know, put a big, you know, thing and, 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 and they protect themselves and they try to isolate. But really, I mean, the Bible says, it, like, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I believe that once you've tasted and, and you've seen, once you've tasted who Jesus really is, nothing in this world tastes good again. Nothing else tastes good. Nothing else tastes good. You're, you just become fixated on him, on Jesus. And I've noticed that for us that, you know, it's hard, you know, nothing. I think David Wagner, when he came, he said, nothing will numb you to the, to the realities of God is, is the, the more that you handle holy things. The more that, the closer you are to the instruments and the tools and the stuff that God uses to touch and the, God, and the things that God uses to, to do ministry, the closer you get to it, the more desensitized you can become to it. And I'm just praying that there would be a divine interruption in this place today. I can't tell you, I can't even begin to tell you how grieved and upset and really just fed up with the devil of how many teenagers are being tormented, are being, pres I mean, prescribed to prescription meds. And look, I get it. God invented medicine, God invented doctors. But I just tell you what, there's so many young people with thoughts of suicide going on in their brain this moment. Just like this man, they cut themselves and there's, they're in, they're in pain. And it's, and it's just my prayer. And it's just, I just came up here and I'm, I'm just trying my best to share what, what I feel the Lord's saying but I feel like there's some divine interruptions in the house. I feel like there's some divine interruptions in the house, just like those disciples were with Jesus and they were shaking it and they were, I mean, it was going down and they had their own thing going. But when Jesus said, we're going to the other side, they were so connected to the master that they couldn't disobey. They couldn't disobey because here's the deal. If there's a big crowd and it's going down, and Jesus says, I'm going to the other side. 
and you decide to stay on the side with the crowd and the fame and the popularity and the easy stuff, but Jesus goes to the other side, you'll find out pretty quick that it's, it's, it's a lot of stress. It's really hard trying to keep something going when God's already moved on. I just want to be with him. I just want to be where he's at. I just want to be doing what he wants to do. And I feel like in the house, there's going to be two things. I feel like God's going to, he's going to, he's going to issue some divine interruptions to our lives to care deeply, to believe deeply, to pray deeply, to give deeply, to sacrifice deeply for a generation that, that doesn't know, that doesn't know Christ. That might look like you serving in the youth ministry. It might look like um, you, generous generosity with your finances. It might look like prayer. It might look like anything. I don't know. It's going to look like something though. It's not, it's, it won't just be a, an emotional response. And the second thing that's going to happen is there's, there's people here today. And regardless if your chains and nakedness and cuts looks like verbatim what this guy in the tombs looked like, or it might look like a very expensive Sunday outfit. But underneath it, there's cuts and there's chains and there's pain and there's bondage. I feel like God wants to set some people free in this place today. That, that, that us in, in full life this morning would even be, just as Jesus called this guy, the reward at the end. That Jesus saw you and he saw me when he crossed the great divide to set us free and to bring freedom to our lives. So would you guys um, stand with me? And as I pray, I would like to invite the worship team back. We try to be sneaky about it. We're just going to take a second. We're going to turn our attention.